Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so this talk is um, it, it's about event-driven. And I, you, know, you always debate on the title. The title is everything. So, so it could have been serverless event-driven for Java developers or Spring developers. And I, re I reason I said Spring developers that is that almost every Java developer is a Spring developer. I, I would guess it's probably on 90%. Uh, you know, we all, it, I've been a Java developer for a long time, using Spring for a long time, but it tends to be that I think Spring developers are, are um, for the most part, focused on building back-end systems, you know, monoliths, microservices, those types of things, not some of the other things that, that, that some people may uh, do with, with Java. So, but I'm a huge fan of event -driven. And I've been talking about it for a while, and now I'm using something that I really can kind of sink my teeth into, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. And I wanted to share it. So my goal is, in this talk, is to really get you uh, thinking seriously about doing things with event-driven, because I think it's, it's um, very powerful and um, pretty interesting. Uh, so th the thing is, though, is that you know when we submit talks for conferences, we have to do it months in advance. So I, I think I submitted my talk last fall, let, maybe uh, maybe uh, in the winter. And uh, since then, it's like holy holy mackerel, the, the uh, AI has come out. I don't know how much each of you have gotten involved in it, but I've just went I'm going crazy with it. And uh, AI has just kind of changed everything. So. What I thought I was going to talk about when I submitted the talk is a little bit different than what I'm going to show you today in this talk, and it's a lot of it's due to all the amazing things that are happening right now with, with AI. So in this talk, I want to do a review of event-driven architecture, kind of a high-level walkthrough, uh, uh, very visual, and then uh, get into some code. I want to just show you, a, a, it's a certain implementation of doing event-driven with Java, but it's more of, I want to kind of show you what I think might be the future of where we're heading with different frameworks for doing things, and, and uh, in particular with, with, uh, with event-driven, but also you know, kind of as serverless and opsless and everything less. It's, it's, we're, I think we're heading in that direction. So it's a bit looking out on some of the things that are available now, and I think the tr some of the trends that are starting to emerge. And then I'm going to go a little nuts on you, where, because everybody thinks I'm crazy about this idea, but I'm just going to keep floating it until they put me away, because I think it's pretty cool. But there's this concept of um, what I'm kind of calling microminds, and uh, how event-driven plays into that. So let's start with a, a review of event-driven architecture. So I, I'm a developer advocate. I've been writing code for like 47 years as a professional developer. So I, I tell everybody I started when I was four years old. That's a lie, but you know, just to kind of hide my age. But I've been writing code for a long time. But for about the last six years or so, I've been a developer advocate. So I don't have to write production code anymore. I get to write fun code. And this one demo that I've, I've work, been working on is called Earthship, and it's a demonstration of, of, of event-driven application. And I always like to do things visually. So I have something to look at besides just you know, like a, you know, a form you know, web form or something like that. So the user interface that I wrote for this application is a map. And you can zoom into any part, anywhere on the Earth. That's why it's called Earthship. And you can create orders. But what you do is you're not creating one order. You're kind of zooming into an area, and you pick a, you know, a circular region. You say, I, I want to create, say, 5,000 or 500 or 100 simulated orders in this spot and really exercise the system. Because I, you know, as a developer advocate, I'm not only you know, advocating to the outside world, but I'm bringing things back into the company. So one of the things I really love to do is beat up our technology and, you know, hit it hard with performance. So this is what this, this demo application does. So all these little dots in the circle represent orders that were created, and they change color to show state and things like that. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a bit. But this is a design diagram of this application. So it's not a trivia application, because it started out as a shopping cart and I got bored with that really, really quick. And I said, you know, what could I do to make this demo more interesting and do it in an event-driven way? So what this, this application does is it also allocates stock to the orders in an event-driven way, which is pretty interesting. So um, I'll be showing, I'll get into more detail on this, but basically those, 
this, the diagonal squares represent services. And so there's 13 services that make up this system. Now, we've been talking about this for years with microservices, that they should be loosely coupled, do one thing, do it well. So these services, kind of by design, are focused to do one simple thing. They don't do transactions. All they do is commands come in, the commands create events, events trigger state changes, and the events get admitted. That's it. Um, so you're really kind of boiling down problems into these small functional units. And this is where things got really, in really interesting. So the flow here is like you have a shopping cart over on the, on the left that sends in a command to say, you know, like, check out the order. So that triggers something interesting in the shopping cart um, service where it goes, okay, I'm going to do a state change. I'm, not, I'm no longer going to be accepting changes to the shopping cart. I'm going to admit an event that says checked out. So the checked out event goes out, but that gets picked up by another service, and it creates an order. Sorry, jumped ahead. So it creates an order. So that triggers the creation of the order. But where the fun comes in is with the map. When the map does it, what happens is the map UI up in the top here, you can see, I hope you can see the highlighted line, maybe not, but it's sending in a command to this generator entity. The generator entity emits events. The events go to this geo order. I, we don't have enough time to go into detail how this works. But you can see the geo order emits an event that starts creating orders. And then orders are creating shipping orders. And this is where we're starting to go into the process of allocating stock to the orders. And th this, it just flows. So you can see the triggering of one entity emits events which cascades to trigger another entities. And this is what got really interesting. I worked really hard on these diagrams. I used Blender to create these diagrams, you got, if you guys know what Blender is. It took a lot of work to do this, but was, what was so much fun was I started to see, uh, you could visually see this cascading eventing flow through the system. This is the behavior of the system. This is how this system works as it's taking in orders and allocating stock to those orders and getting those orders ready to ship. So these 13 entities or 13 services are collaborating with each other. And the cool thing is, is each of these services knows nothing about the other services. They're completely isolated. All they know is what commands are coming in and they emit events. They don't care who or what consumes those events. That's not the concern of each indiv individual service. So the behavior of the system is a composition and the wiring of all the different services together. And this is where I think event-driven really gets cool. So there's this kind of flow that's going on as, as the processing. And there's things like saga patterns in here. You know, for, uh, there's actually two type, kinds of saga patterns. There's orchestrated sagas where there's a controller controlling the, the saga operations. And there's choreographed. And th these are choreographed sagas where they don't depend on the controller. It's just the behavior of the events that are being emitted by the different services, which are triggering kind of like the, there's a allocation of stock as a mutually agreeable series of state changes, basically. No transactions. It's just events that are occurring, but they trigger these mutually agreeable, eventually consistent types of state changes. So this is the demo. And uh, again, it, you know, it has this map front end. So, the other interesting thing about the system is there's just three fundamental components that are used to build it. There's the services themselves, and, are called, and this implementation are called entities. But you can, I th kind of think of them as very small, very focused microservices. But they're all, you can also kind of think of them as distributed, durable objects. Okay, And they're stateful, by the way, in, in this, this system. And then there's actions. And the actions are the things that take in an event and transform events coming downstream into commands that go further down you know, into the next uh, service. So checkout is an event that goes into this action, which is a stateless function, which transforms that, uh, that event into a command like create order. And this is how you wire everything together. So, and there's this kind of detachment between the services through these wiring up functions. So let's take a look at a little bit of the code. I'm working on a, a new demo that I'm calling Wing Plan. And it's just a, I just want to you know, do something else. And in Wing Plan, 
One of the first systems I worked on when I first started writing code was a flight scheduling system for, I, was, I got a degree in aeronautical engineering, and the school had a flight school. And I, got, I took a computer programming class, and I just fell in love with it. So I got my engineering degree, aeronautical engineering degree, but I went into straight, straight into computers. But anyways, while I was at school, I got into writing code. One of the systems was, the, for, the, for the flight school, was a flight scheduling system. So it was, you know, the, there's a student, there's an instructor, there's aircraft. They all need to be scheduled together. And you know, so I thought, OK, that might be fun to implement using the venture in a way. So I'm in the middle of the development of this, this um, application. And I just want to show you some of the pieces of it. And this is where you see some familiarity if you're a Spring developer. Like, you know, the API, I'm using, um, you know, the, the Spring um, request mapping, for example. And you can see things like, you know, put mapping. So I'm just defining the API of the service. Things like uh, schedule. So, the, you know, this, this command com is coming in called schedule. But here I want to show you something different. This might seem a little futuristic, but this is real. This implementation doesn't know about databases. It doesn't know about database transactions. What happens is that a command comes in, and then the command returns what's called an effect, which is basically just a response from the command. But the cool part here is you, there's this emit event. And that's where the, the service has taken in a command, created an event, and it, it just gives the event back to the system, whatever that system happens to be. And the system's responsible for persisting that event. So all that responsibility for dealing with putting events in the database, retrieving events from the database, and th those types of things are just out of the, you know, abstracted away in this kind of an implementation. The other thing is you can see there's, there's this current state method, and that's an inherited method. So the retrieval of the state of the, this thing, whatever it happens to be, a shopping cart, an order, a flight schedule, uh, you know, a flight schedule, uh, or training session schedule, is uh, retrieved from the database, but that's just all mechanical. So I, you know, I don't have to write any code for, for doing that. So again, this is kind of the futuristic part of it. That's it. I don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about as a developer, these kinds of things. More and more tools like this are showing up that are abstracting away more and more complexity. And this is just one example. And I think this is going to accelerate massively now that we're in the age of, of AI. So I define my APIs. The other part of this is uh, event handlers. So you can see they're annotated because you have to declare how to handle events. So a command creates an event, and then events get persisted, and uh, there's handlers for that. And you can see here that it's, again, that current state method is used to um, retrieve the state. The system does that. And then all I'm doing is uh, returning the altered state as a result of that uh, event. So that's the code. So this is my style of coding here, the way I'm doing it. But I, try, I wanted to keep my APIs and my event handlers kind of agnostic of business code because the, the business code is handled in um, state, a, a, a record called state. Um, I love the evolution of Java lately. And um, in the last few years, I think this is my third most favorite recent change. You know, it was lambdas, it was streams, and now records. I love records. So I try and use records all the time now. I just started, you know, it hasn't been that long that I've been using them, but I just love them now. Anyways, the state represents the state of the thing, right? The shopping cart, the order, uh, a unit of stock, a, a student, a, uh, a flight schedule. All these things are just objects, right, that we think about all the time. They're kind of formalized here. This is what's encompassed in this service. You're, the service is only responsible for this unit of state. You define the state. It's basically just an object. But the commands come in. Commands create events. Events trigger state changes. That's it. That's the flow of, of the way this system works. So within this state uh, record, I and again, this is my style. Other developers are doing it a different way. You know, we always, if you give 10 programmers the same problem to solve, we're all going to write it, solutions for it in 10 different ways. It was like when I was in college, 
and our, I was in this class, and he gave us a specification for coming up with an airplane with, you know, same engine, same requirements, but every airplane was different, right? So it's the same thing with code. Anyways, um, I have these event for methods, and the event for methods are just handling the command, and they emit an event, right? That's all this code's responsible for. So normally, here I don't do any state changes because I've got these event for methods for the different commands coming in, maybe a bit, a bit, little bit of checking, business logic, maybe some item potent checking because this item potent's important, which I'll explain in a little bit. But then I have these on, of, on methods, and these are the methods that actually do st um, perform state changes because you can see each one of these, and I'm just using on overloaded. Um, they perform state changes. So you can see in many cases right now that this thing's really simple. Um, let's see if I can find. Yeah, this one's pretty simple. Let me see if I'm in the right class. So you know you, it can get a little bit more complicated in here where you're doing some business logic, but because we're not reaching out to you know the, the what one of my colleagues says the these things don't have any friends. They can't talk to anybody when they're doing their work. When a command comes in, by design, this service has to have everything it needs to perform its operation. It can't reach out to databases to get more information. So maybe some validation has to happen before the command comes in. So it's a different way of thinking about it, but it's this loosely coupled way of doing things. But, and it forces you to kind of condense the problem into its simplest forms, which is really interesting at the, at the design phase. So at the, at the very end, um, I just, you know, you, I, and it, again, my style, I just use records to define my commands and my events. So you can see there is a schedule command and, and a scheduled past tense. So commands, and, you, and, uh, and I'm glad to see in other conferences and co this conference that there's more and more sessions about uh, event-driven, event sourcing, those types of things. But just to kind of review, commands are requests to perform an operation that hasn't occurred yet. It's, you know, it's, I, please schedule this flight for me. Please process this order for me. Events are historical units of fact. It's something that's happened in the past. So typically you'll see events in a past tense term, like scheduled event, right? Instead of uh, you know, a future tense. So you just um, you know, create some different things. So I think I've got time, and the Wi-Fi is up. So I want to show you, you know, adding a little bit. I want to add a new command. Um, Update status command. So this is AI. OK, now you want to ask. I'm using Google, uh, uh, GitHub Copilot. How many people are using Copilot? Man, dudes, <laughs> you are missing out, man. I am telling you, this is blowing my mind. It's, it's like when I'm coding, it's like it's reading. It's in my head. I'm, I swear, it, you know, they call this, you can see it's kind of light, they call it ghost code, right? So it's like, I say update, sta I, I didn't even finish the word status, and it goes, oh yeah, you want to do an update status command, okay, fine, all right? And then I come down, and, I, and it goes, boom, I didn't even type anything. I just hit enter a couple times, and it says, status updated event, you want one of those? Yeah, sure, I want that, boom, done. You know, it's like, this is insane. You know, th so it's really crazy. It's not always perfect. You know, I left out a curly brace here. I'll forgive it for that. But it definitely owns, it earns its $10 a month for me. It costs me 10 bucks a month to use this. So it's pretty, pretty crazy. So, um, so this is the AI part where, you know, they, you might have heard the term prompt engineering. How do you prompt an AI to give it what you want? So one of the things that people are starting to talk about is prompt engineering and source code. And... The, uh, the process here is I'm kind of working backwards. Let me define the command and event, and let me work backwards through the code back up to the top where, you know, through the API. So then what I want to do is go back into the state, and I want to handle that event. So I'll go in here, and uh, it, it might, it, you know, it's not infallible. 
58. If I could type here. There you go. And uh, let's see if it's sorry. The uh, it hasn't done everything I want, but uh, it, it, you get the idea. I'd have to clean it up a little bit, but uh, you know, it, it's 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 kind of figured out some more things that I, that I would do in this code. So let me just move on real quick because I'm running out of time. So I want to do the event for for this, and this one's kind of easy, so hopefully you'll guess it pretty quick. Yeah, there it goes. You know, it's like, <laughs> come on. You know, so it's just, it's, uh, you know, you, you have to clean up some code a little bit. Sometimes, sometimes it gets, it gets a dead on. And um, did I get the... Ah, this is why. This is why it's all wrong. Okay. Here we go. Let's see if these methods, yeah, now it's a little bit happier. So in any case, um, just moving fast. So I, you know, I can go up and then I can do the, you know, like I'll add an event handler. And again, it's kind of reading my mind. It keeps wanting to do that canceled event. There we go. Even my log statements, you know, it's like, the way I, my, I've been writing the log statements in this code is just kind of mimicking that. So it just kind of goes on and on and on here, um, where you know it's it's pretty simple. So the the whole idea here is that um, I think because the code is simpler, it makes it simpler to use AI, which you guys really should be checking out, um, and uh, and you know, the whole process gets. A lot more fun, actually. So th that's kind of it. The um, the the uh, the Airship demo has a lot more code in it because it has a lot of entities. You know, it's got 13 entities. It's got about 25, 26 actions, a bunch of CQRS views. You know, command query responsibility segregation. If if you uh, haven't heard about that before, but that's where the services are focused on writing, and the views or projections are called, they're focused on reading, and they're separated from each other. They're segregated from each other. So this, this, this uh, project has a lot more code, but again, simple little chunks of code to just keep banging out. And it got, actually got, kind of got boring because I'm just you know, banging out a lot of the same code until I had the AI that helped me do it along because now it just accelerated the whole process. And now I'm kind of exp ex uh, experimenting with ChatGPT with that as well, uh, which is a whole other ball game. So that's a little bit of the code. Um, and this is a little, also a little bit why I said Spring, because it's you know, somewhat familiar to Spring developers, especially on, on the API side, but where things get really different is on the persistence side. You, know, you just don't, 
it's really abstracted away. I have no idea what database it's, this is being used. This is running on a platform. Um, the, uh, there's other tools that are showing up that are doing something simpler, similar where they're abstracting away the database and they're simplifying things. And I think it's a really uh, kind of cool new paradigm for, for doing development. So let me get into the crazy part. That's micromind. What do I mean by a micromind? Well, you know, as I was watching that diagram, you know, my, my little animation where I was showing the cascading sequence of events through the services, you know, and I'm, I've been kind of fascinated with uh, neural nets and how the brain works for a long time. So, I, you know, I'm a dead amateur, but I've been, you know, there's a lot of really cool stuff in YouTube about it. And, and actually now, it's, uh, I've had some great conversations with Bard, you know, Google Bard, their AI, and OpenAI's ChatGPT, just asking it questions about neurons and synapses and how things work was really, I mean, it's a great, great learning tool. It was just amazing. Anyways, I started thinking, wait a minute. These services are kind of behaving like neurons. So in a neuron, it, it's really simple. But it, this is how our brains work. And, um, but it, it, it's simple, where a signal comes in, and the signal may or may not trigger a given neuron to emit another signal. That's it. Now, the actual molecular and atomic uh, mechanisms within a neuron is fascinating. If you, if you check that stuff out, it's just absolutely amazing what's going on inside of it. But mechanically, it's really simple. Signals come in, and maybe signals go out, and this is how your brain works. This is how we, we know how to drive cars, and they've been spending billions of dollars trying to figure out how to teach AIs to drive cars, and they haven't gotten there yet. But you can train your kid or you can train yourself to learn how to drive a car in a couple days, right? So something really is different going on here. But anyways, because um, I think they're, they're doing things a little bit different than the way natural brains work. But back here, um, I was thinking, wait a minute. Okay, these services are behaving kind of like neurons. And then these little um, uh, functions that are transforming events into commands are kind of like synapses, because what a synapse is, is the way your brain is wired together, they, there's a, a nerve comes out of, uh, they call it the axon, comes out of the, the uh, ha handles the signal coming out of a neuron, and it just gets real close, but there's still a gap between the, what's called the dendrite, which goes into the next neuron, and there's this, ca there's this gap, and chemicals go over this gap. So they, they call that the synapse. Well, I kind of thought, well, that's what these functions look like. So the, the, my little diagram, you can see there's a little line there. You know, that's my little synapse because it events come in, commands go out. And that's the processing of, of the signals. And this is the way this demo works. So again, watching this, you know, a, a single event or a single command comes into this service called generator. Generator starts spewing out signals. Right? It's, it's going to create 500 or 1,000, whatever orders it was asked to create. So it's creating massive amounts of these geo orders, which are just orders at a geographic location. It emits events, which are signaling other ones. So again, just like neurons, neurons emit signals, but they have no idea who's going to consume those signals. In fact, what really kind of amazes me, there's supposedly like 86, 87 billion neurons in, in the average human brain but there's trillions of connections. So every neuron has like 10,000 connections. It's something like that. It's just amazing. Well, in this system, there's a far fewer connections, but there still are connections. But there's this loose coupling that's happening throughout the entire system, which is really good from a software standpoint. So there's this cascading sequence of events that's occurring. No transactions. Nothing's going on. High concurrency. And... Anything can break here. Any part, uh, part of this process can break and get restarted, and it will pick up where it left off. So unlike the large language models, they call them like ChatGPT and BARD and all these other ones, where they, you may have heard where they can hallucinate, they can lie with confidence. We can't build business systems this way, but this business system is absolutely precise. Nothing will break it. It's, it, you know, it's dedicated. So it's kind of like the instinctive hardwiring that, it, that you know, animals and humans are born with. You know, there's some hardwired things that you don't have to learn, 
that are in your brain. This is kind of what's happening here. This is hardwired instinctive behavior built in this system. So it has to have the precision of enterprise backend systems, which this does. And this, this was kind of blowing my mind because I got this working and as I was beating it up and it's like, okay, man, this is, this is not too bad. And, and then this whole micromind idea started coming out. And I thought, okay, this is kind of wild. So there's all these cascading sequence of events. And there's this idea that uh, and this is where the micro, you know, it's like, this is, think of it as a little mind, micro mind. Instead of a microservice, it's a, you know, it's a, it, it, you know, micro mind is more of an application scope than a service scope. But still, it's this behavior where the services are small, tight, focused services. And you're strictly uh, adhering to the behavior of, of, of event driven, where, you know, something emits an event and doesn't know or care where it's going, but, but there's, uh, there can be challenges. I, I, you know, as I was designing this system, I, um, I, I definitely ran into challenges because I had to kind of rethink. You know, I had decades of experience using databases, transactions, all that stuff, and I was kind of had to, to let that stuff go and go in different directions. And it was hard at first, but what's really interesting here is that patterns started to emerge as well. And what I mean by this is that there's, um, of the 13 services here, there's four that I call, I, I kind of, for lack of a better term, I call a reduction tree. And, and I, you know, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to explain it, but um, I, I will explain it a little bit. The, the problem is you have an item, uh, a system that the messages are delivered with at least once delivery, which means that you can get the message, the same message more than once. So, you know, you're a service and you get a command in and says, you know, change your state. And then that same command comes in and says, change your state. And then the, the service has to know, well, wait a minute, should I do this or not? Did I, did I just see this command or not? And this is where you have to think about things being item potent. Item potent means that you, say, you perform the same operation multiple times, but you get the exact same result each time. So when you think about that, and this is where things get really interesting, think about counters, like inventory. You know, in a typical order processing system, you're just decrementing um, the count, right? How many, how, you know, like how many units of a particular order, uh, stock item are available, and you, you just want to decrement it. Yeah, this order is going to use three, okay, we subtract three. Another one comes in 10, subtract 10. Another one comes in, subtract one. But how do you do that item potently? That's where things got really, really interesting. And it took me in a, in a very different direction because I was, you know, I'm new to this and uh, I think a lot of us are. Um, but the surprising result was after all my pain and suffering and crying and thinking and rethinking and stuff like that, kind of working my way onto the other side from kind of what I consider to be monolithic thinking and like monolithic transactions, database transactions that hit multiple tables, which really makes it difficult for services to be loosely coupled because my service and your service both share the same table. So now we're, we're kind of coupled, those types of things. We, we've, we've been struggling to try and break, you know, be loosely coupled, but we you know, keep being, getting pulled back to the, you know, kind of the monolithic way. So in a way, I, I kind of feel like a lot of what we've been doing for the last few years with microservices is that they're just little chunks of monoliths. They still have the same behavior as monoliths. And this was forcing me into a, an entirely different direction where it's like you cannot break this rule. The services cannot talk to anything other than their journal. The only thing the service has is its state. The only thing it can change is its state. That's it. Deal with it. And, by the way, it has to be item potent. So it drove the design of this demo in a direction I never anticipated at first, but it drove it to simplicity, I think. And now that I'm, uh, like I'm getting back to the patterns, and then the, the surprise was these recurring patterns. So these reduction trees are an approach for item potently handling say, reducing a lot of data into a single value or a single set of values. That's what a reduction tree is. And there's four of them in here, right? So it's like the same pattern was emerging. 
there's a, a couple, there's this one to many where um, an event comes into a, the function, to, to the action, but it fires off multiple commands. So like a, a shopping cart comes in and it's got three items. So one event comes into an action, but that function fires off three commands to three different uh, other services, one to handle each of, of the items in the shopping cart. So this, this one-to-many pattern is all over the place. So this is where it's, it got cool. So I said, and I, I mentioned in the beginning, I love to visualize things. And uh, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Um, how, many, how many of you are familiar with Blender? Blender is a, it's an open source tool, blender.org. Um, you can do 3D visualizations with it, and you can do 3D animations with it. So I've been using it for 3D visualizations for years, and I love it. So I've been kind of an amateur with, with Blender for a long time, but I've always wanted to do an animation um, with it. And it, I've been, you know, there's thousands of YouTube videos on tutorials on using Blender, so there's no lack of information about using it. Well, I, I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to take log data from, a, from this Earthship demo and render it to show the activity in the system. So what I did was I did that in Blender. And um, let me show you. I've got, to show, I've got a short animation here I want to show you. So this is one order that came in. So one shopping cart, and this triggered the activity. And then another shopping cart came in. And then a third one. This is where I manually created three shopping carts. But then the generator, that map thing, is going to kick in. And now it's handling the creation of 200 doors. So this is real data from the logs where I'm rendering it you know, in this multi-dimensional space. So the lines that are flashing are real events triggering commands into other entities. So this is the behavior of the system. The red is orders that went into back order state because there's insufficient stock. But that trigger is ordering more stock. And as the stock flows into the system, it goes hunting down the back order. So you see the red turning to green, which means the order, you know, those orders are ready to ship. And then watch the top left at the very end here. There was kind of that flash of activity. That's a reduction tree that was you know, consuming all that data and reducing it. But it's not just two-dimensional. So in this, it, handling the 200 uh, orders, there's about 10,000 entities that were created, 10,000 dots. But these are just objects. Like I said, these are just durable, distributed objects. And this is the system, but you can see everything. This is Earthship. So the diagram I showed you before, the design diagram, is just this rendered in a slightly different way. But you can see they're all linked together. There's all these different lines that are flowing between it. And this was a, kind of the micromind picture that I had on my head. This is the way this application works, which I think is cool as not. You know, it's like, and this is something else here. So, um, so with the, with the event-driven, I think, this is the kind of systems you're building. The tools vary, but that's, you know, it, that's fine. You know, we always have different tools, but it's the concepts, I think, that are really compelling here. And, there, and everything's going to be moving very, very fast, and I think this area is going to move very fast as well. So very cool. So enough for the animation. So just kind of as a review the, uh, with the Micromind, and again, I talk to my colleagues at work, and they think I'm nuts. They say, what kind of drugs am I on? You know, that kind of thing. It's like, um, and I'm not. I don't even drink, but it's like, but this is my drug, man. You know, this stuff, just my mind is like, wow, it's blown. So I'm kind of thinking like these, these small, very loosely coupled, very focused, do one thing kinds of services, we're pushing it down to similar behavior to neurons. And guess what? Neurons are the result of millions of years of of uh, iterative development, right? Testing, 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 testing until this, this comes out. Another thing that was really fascinating that I heard is that we have a second brain, they call it. There's a, about a half a million neurons that handle your gut. So uh, you, can you can think of names for the, the second brain. <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but, uh, you know, but it's like a half a million neurons. So I didn't know th about that. But it's like, wait, fascinating. But these things are controlling... Our body, they control the bodies of animals, they control the bodies of insects. It's just amazing uh, what you can do. 
But this concept is very, very fundamental. It feels kind of natural when I'm writing software in this way. These actions are like synapses. You're, 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 um, they're not quite, because the actions can also retrieve data. The, the, the uh, services can't retrieve data, but if you need extra data, like some of this, the, in the Earthship, you know, it had to look for available stock. So I had to do a query against the view to find something that's available for stock so it could join, you know, it could, it could trigger the allocation of stock to the order, those types of things. So, um, but actions basically are taking events and transforming them into commands. Plus, yeah, the, the, you, the, the system should provort, uh, provide at least once delivery of messages. And because that's really important. Because, but in this system, uh, I didn't have to worry about databases. I also didn't have to worry about message buses, those types of things. But you know, we know how to deal with databases. We know how to deal with, with message buses. And message buses for a long time you know, give us at least once delivery, those types of things, which is great. But the deal is you got to think about item potency. And this, this is a, something new we haven't had to deal with. We've been hooked on ACID, you know, the ACID transactions for a long time, and has kind of held us off from having to face item potency in a distributed system. But um, I can tell you, I think, I think it's a good thing. It forces you to build systems in a better way. What also was interesting, and I had no idea about this, but then you know, these patterns started to emerge, and I, I'm where you know, these choreographed sagas, Generation loops, reduction trees. Reduction trees are really interesting. Uh, first place I ran into it, we, we, had a, we wanted to write a proof of concept where we were taking in transactions that had to be reduced to merchant payments. So this is financial data and was coming at a very, very high rate. So we, we used a reduction tree to handle that, you know, the reduction of a lot of detailed information, fully audible, fully restartable, fully distributed, and it, it would sum up without error into merchant payments because we're dealing with, with financial data. That's a reduction tree. All on a relatively, uh, you know, these individual components are relatively simple. The fun part, I think, and this is really for the humans, us, is the design you know, of these systems. How do you wire? You know, you're the designer of the mind here in a, in a way. And we, and we always been doing that. So we looked at event-driven architecture Look at a little bit of code. I hope you get at least pique your interest to, to take a look at it, yeah, because uh, Copilot, they're getting ready to release Copilot X, which is going to boost it even more, right? I mean, for the last year, it's just been amazing me. You know, I run out, you know, I work at home when I'm not traveling, and, and I'll be coding away, and I'll come out to my wife and say, man, this thing, it's in my head, you know, it's just, it's just right, you know, I can't believe how much code it writes for me. And then the Micromind concept. Maybe you think I'm crazy, hopefully not. Maybe, maybe it will inspire you to, t uh, to kind of think about these things. So I want to leave you with um, something important. Now, for people coming to conferences, I think in general, I'm preaching, they say, to the choir. You guys are here to learn. You guys are here to learn new things. But your colleagues, those poor colleagues that are different, you know, they're stuck in their ways, more than ever, I think this is really important. I love this, I saw this, this quote a while back. The, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I think this is so important right now. We have to be able to unlearn. So again, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys get it. But maybe take this back to your colleagues when they're arguing with you and you're trying, hey, I saw this really cool thing. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. It's like, come on, come on, this is so cool. Try it out. Scare them with this, you know, something like this. Here's the next one. This is relatively new. AI will not replace you. People using AI will. And what I mean by this is that I've been using it quite a bit. The, that um, application I wrote to do the animation, was Python using the Blender API. The Blender, Blender's been around for about 10 years or so. It's got a massive API. I know Python. I'm pretty comfortable with it. I'm primarily a, you know, like a Java developer, but I, I, I'm pr fairly proficient in Python. But I was always afraid to try and write something big with, uh, to do the animation. So I went to ChatGPT, and me and my buddy ChatGPT wrote six or 700 lines of Python to do that animation I showed you. 
and it took me days. It was like, and I was just going, write me this function. and go, sure, here you go. And it wasn't always right. And we, you know, we had to iterate, and I had to clean some things up. And, you know, but I was learning like crazy about the Blender API. So I went from a dead novice Blender Python programmer to a senior developer overnight with ChatGPT, right? So this is what we need to be afraid of. If you, I don't know where everybody's heads are at right now individually, but in our industry, I mean, the CEO of um, NVIDIA, I think it was yesterday, had you know, made huge announcements. Their stock went way up again. But he said, everybody's a programmer. I don't believe it, but I think programmers are, there's going to be like two different huge levels of programmers. Programmers that are being bootstrapped and accelerated by AI and programmers that are not. And that gap is going to widen very, very rapidly. So keep an eye out for this. So with that, uh, this QR code, if you're interested in the slides, um, you, you, know, you can grab this deck. All the pictures, by the way, were generated by an AI. So this picture here was generated by an AI, sorry, generated by an AI, and uh, it's called Midjourney. So it, it used to be when I would make presentations, I'd have to hurt, look all over the place for images that I could use and you know, all that kind of stuff. Now I just go to Midjourney, and I say, hey, give me an image that looks like this, and it goes, sure, here you go. Here's four of them, pick one, you know, that type of thing. So that's it, thank you very much.